Hi, my name is Scrimshire and I have been doing these production walkthroughs to go through the processes behind making my albums. This time I thought we would have a look at Heron. It's from the album Nothing Feels Like Everything. This song actually was written just after I finished mixing the album Listeners. It was written in the gap pretty much between when I finished it and when I released it. So about April 2019. There was a direct inspiration. There is a song by Nina Simone called Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. It's a cover of The Animals. And there's a live version of it. And it's got this incredible blues and just so evocative for this intro. And I was completely, like, absolutely stunned by it when I heard it. And I was like, oh my God, I'd love, I would love to make a piece of music like that. At least for the next four minutes. So obviously I didn't want to completely rip off Nina Simone's arrangement. But it was just the emotional and kind of vibe inspiration for where I wanted to start with the track. And that's where I started with the first few chords and just trying to get this alternation between two chords that I could then build on and create a vibe from. At this point I knew I wasn't gonna straight away start laying percussion and all the other layers on, but I wanted to create the space for something like that idea to exist within. So I worked just with the guitar and the road, so I recorded the MIDI here so I would remember it. And I actually fired pretty much straight into uh, a song idea. Something that uh, I discovered recently um, a video of when I was trying to find out how I played this song in the first place. Um, I found a video of me sitting on the bed recording uh, some chord ideas which appear in this version. So I pushed straight into setting up a little click track of sorts that I could write along to. At the time I was really into using kind of 808 electronic sounds but putting them in a space as if they were in a room uh, separate to everything else. And I'd already been playing with that idea a little bit with things like uh, Won't Get Better featuring Imogene Thackray on the listeners record. So that's just an So we've got a pretty straightforward kind of 808 sound here, and I'm just using the snare and hi-hat. I wanted to give myself a click track without playing to a click track. I'm terrible at playing to click tracks, so I try to use a rhythm or a shaker these days instead. I pushed that through a bunch of effects. The Fab Filter Saturn is here, which just gives it a little distortion. You can see there's old tape setting to try and get a little of that tape, so old tape sound. I, came out, I think I was thinking of uh, imagining it was being played off a tape deck in a room on the other side somewhere, and I'd be playing guitar nearer to you. Then trying to control those frequencies as well. You know, if you were listening to it in a room, you wouldn't necessarily hear it as if you were listening to it just on a set of headphones, so cutting down the range of what we were hearing, taking a little bass and a little top end out of it. And then into this, the Valhalla room. I love Valhalla effects, the reverbs are amazing. And this just allows me to set that mix of how much of the reverb is on there. From dry. Right the way up to about 86% what we're doing there. Not a too large a room. You can see the potential we have within that, but kept it pretty short. Small room. The other thing that I really loved with this, and I think it was an accident, I have to say I can't truly remember how this came up, but I think I was using this one particular sound to try and get just a bit of punctuation to let me know where I was in the beat, in the bar. I think once it came through all those effects, I realised there was a really mad sound that, that, it, that it was making. So that's the conga just sounded great, but then I thought I could get more out of that. The Galaxy Tape Echo, which emulates uh, literally like a tape loop and the sound of dirty tape as it's looping around there. And you can hear the imperfections in the, in the delay as it happens.
So here's the original drum beat. I just used a basic, like one of the preset drum kits that's available in, in Ableton to get me started. Batu kit. Just to give me a groove. And that then gave me the space to pick up the bass guitar. And just drop a nice, simple bass line actually quite far into the track, allowing the verses and everything to come through quite a lot before getting into the bass. I liked that sense of anticipation and the amount of space that we were leaving in the whole thing. So that was in 2019, April. It wasn't until December that year that, you know, after, well, after releasing listeners, doing all the promo work on it, putting a band together to play it live, we did a few shows. After those shows, I immediately wanted to crack on with, with writing the next record, which was going to turn out to be Believers Volume 1. I had seven songs written at that point in time that I knew that I wanted to commit to. Out of those seven songs, only three made it onto Believers. So yeah, like there's, there's still three songs from that recording session that I've done nothing with, and I don't even know how to fit them in to anything anymore, which is bugging me a little but uh, maybe one day they'll find their place as well. So let's have a look at the next project. Down here we'll have, as ever, the magnificent Chris Boot on drums. He first of all layered up what I'd done with the electronic drums, with the 808s. He also layered the bits in the middle. We had to do some work here with moving tempos around so we could get onto that because there is a tempo change in here. It's like 68 beats per minute in those da 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 um, And then the main song's at 107 beats per minute. Then we have the main beat replacing the Batu kit. And Chris, as ever, just giving me some variation as well and creates this openness that for me, was a really significant change moment in, in this whole song of understanding how it could become this lavish kind of piece. So he does that around about here. Let's have a listen. Absolutely beautiful. The other thing that we did do, and this unfortunately didn't work as well as I hoped it would, but we recorded some brushed hats on their own to just get a really wide stereo hat. I thought that I could get this big hollow open stereo sound and frankly, you know, I think I just, we, I didn't understand how to achieve it from a technical perspective other than in the studio. It became too much, especially low frequency noise and it kept clashing with the vocal too much. Um, and I really wanted the vocal to be low, lots of like low mid frequencies, uh, lots of warmth that bring it up really close to the listener and make it feel really sort of like it's right next to you, you know? So we had to sacrifice a little bit of that. They're still in there, but they're just very much like little sizzly sounds. Once I had the drums, it was a case of sending over to Miriam and letting her do her thing. I didn't have to do too much to that. Um, I copied and pasted um, for the chorus parts, I copied and pasted one, uh, the early chorus and used it as a double on the latter chorus and the latter chorus and used it on a double on the first chorus just to get a little extra uh, niceness um, in those moments and just lift it out of being just a solo vocal, just a touch, you know, just to get some extra energy. And in this project, at this point, this is when I laid into doing all of the percussion parts and they're all recorded in stereo, some djembe, two lots of djembe, three lots of djembe, four lots of djembe. <laughs> and then all of that through some pretty heavy processing to try and get some dirtiness and old age into it, some EQ, uh, some of the Universal Audio Capital Chamber, sort of like a classic sounding reverb, um, some more EQ some absolute squashy, squashy percussion to really mash it up. And then through this great plugin by XLN, um, the Retro Color, which emulates all kinds of different kind of old sounds like tape or VHS or, or vinyl even, um, 
And I do use this a lot just for a little extra nostalgic kind of grit. So this is the mix in Luna. I'll be honest with you, I really struggled with the mix on this track. It was the last track I mixed on the album and I had some really specific things that I wanted from it sonically and I was struggling to get them. Uh, you can see the amount of stuff <laughs> that I used. I try to keep it pretty minimal when I mix. I try to achieve much of the sound in the recording process. So when there's this much stuff going on on tracks, like the strings here and the drums get quite a lot of processing here on top of what they've already had over here, which is a ton of different stuff. I think you can see that I was fighting the mix a little bit. But, you know, it's just how it is sometimes. These are the original guitars. The original Rhodes. And the original bass. And we still have some of the electric drums here in the part, with, along with the main drums. Heavy processing and a parallel drum bus here. It runs alongside the other one. I mix it in a little bit, but it's a lot more distorted and crunchy, just to give it a little extra. There's a little thing with Miriam towards the end that I really like. What I've done here is basically take a copy of one part of the vocal that she did here. You can see I just cut it straight out and put it down onto another channel. And then I panned one far right and then I took the other and I actually moved it up an octave and uh, moved it over to the other channel to the left. and put a lot of reverb on it. The strings are through at this stage, and uh, Bev even said to me, you know, that, that uh, she'd had a lot of ideas and put a lot of them down. So I did in fact do some editing with the strings, more so than with on the pile. With a song that has quite a few different sections, it really, really needed for me to lock down what each section was. And using rep rep repetitions of the strings throughout really helped me to set that. The other thing, um, Frank had been playing some fantastic oud uh, on Bev's album, and I couldn't resist asking him to do some for me. Uh, he said, here's two oud solos uh, which he provided for the end section here but uh, I liked both of them so I had them both. Uh, I managed to just about managed to squeeze the other one in over here as well. It's just so good I could not not, not have it. So the priority was always the sound of the vocal then secondly for me the sound of the drums and thirdly, the sound of the strings, and then everybody, everything else just to fit in around that. Time was a real factor of this song. It was pretty much the very last track that I mixed. So that would have been May 2021. So that's two years after it was written. And this reflects on a lot of things for me. I have a funny relationship with doing live music, and, and sometimes it, it, this, is, this, this kind of plays into that to some degree. I wrote and recorded this two years ago. The guitar parts that I recorded in that session, and the keys that I recorded in that session, I never changed. So I never played, I've never played this song. I haven't played this song on an instrument since 2019. In fact, I picked up a guitar today and spent like an hour trying to work out how it worked in the first place. Um, but that's how this happens sometimes. You know, I, I write, record, produce, arrange as I'm going along. And um, in cases like this where you just kind of get it right at the time, there's no need for me to go back and revisit the whole recording. There are bits in the piano part, in the keys, in the roads on this, that honestly could be played better. Uh, but sometimes you worry about pulling at the thread and where that's going to lead you. 
the time that was allowed to evolve, the decision not to put it on believers to hold on and, and move forward, that allowed two really important things for this record. One, I met Miriam Solomon. The other thing that happened was that uh, at the beginning of 20, I'm going to say 2021, I mixed uh, an album for Beverly Harling. The process of working with Bev and her partner Frank, um, they're both such incredible musicians and arrangers and Bev plays violin, Frank also can play a little violin and viola. And we worked on the pile and we worked on this one. The pile we got out of the way early because it was quite big and complex and there was, uh, you know, it was going to be challenging. Uh, for Heron, that came a little later, so those strings came through right towards the end of the project. But again, without time having moved the way it did and, and allowing this song to wait for the right moment, the right album, the right time, uh, it just wouldn't be, well, it wouldn't be this, uh, the heron that, that you know. But I would say this is, this is basically a heron. That original demo from 2019. December. 2019 drums with Chris. Vocals in 2020. Strings in 2021. Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed having a little look into how it kind of came to be. Um, there's a link to check out the full song, as always, in the description for this. And um, if you subscribe uh, to the channel as well, there will be more of these um, for all the productions I do. Leave your comments, let me know if there's specific things that you would like to know about the song, because I'm more than happy to try and like, chat about what you want to know, you know? You know? So, do that too. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again next time.